you very much for coming. Um, this is beginning and intermediate acting, Thart 120 and 121. This is an acting class. Um, a lot of people watch movies, watch television shows, um, accept the convention of people getting up and pretending to be other people. Very few people actually know what goes into becoming those characters. My job with these students is to acquaint them with the process. They have not disappointed me. Um, they are superb, superbly talented students, and they've risen to the challenge in a way that I did not expect. And we are now coming to the end of uh, something that I created, which I hope will become a tradition, which is that they've been going to local high schools with scenes from Shakespeare and from Arthur Miller. They've been going into classrooms, moving the desks to the side, and performing scenes from the high school curriculum in the classrooms for the students. The idea, of course, is that when you study these texts in high school, you dissect them like you do a frog in a science class. The authors, the playwrights, didn't intend those plays to be dissected. They intended those plays to be performed. And that's what my students do. Almost none of my students had any experience with acting. Some of them did plays in school. Some of them did uh, some acting elsewhere. But mainly, all of them came to this fresh with no idea. And when you come to acting new, there's a lot of things that have to be got rid of. Number one, self-consciousness. The ability to look another person in the eye for an extended period of time. To be able to touch another actor without self-consciousness, but with permission. To be able to control their emotions, use their own emotions, and inject those emotions into a character is normal for an actor. But for a student, a college level and some high school level students, that's a challenging thing. These students have done that. And when you see what they accomplish with being able to use their emotions in these characters in such a sophisticated and intelligent way, you can see what they've accomplished is huge. So, in the process, my job is to empower students um, and facilitate their, their growth. Um, one student that I found early on who I could rely on totally um, has been Stephanie over, where is she? Right, right in front of me here. Um, so, right there. Hi, Stephanie. <laughs> Stephanie became my company manager when it became apparent that not only is she a wonderful performer, which you will see this afternoon, but she's completely reliable. She has been at every single show, whether she was performing or not, uh, and she has kept the company together because I have a day job. Um, so I could only make two of the performances at the high schools. Otherwise, these students went out on their own, as a unit. They got each other's backs. They helped each other. And the way it was set up is that when one student couldn't make it, there was another student who could step in and perform that part equally well. So they are a unit, they are a family, and that's part of being an actor. Because you live an itinerant life, you don't spend too much time with one group of people. You move from job to job. You're with different people all the time. You're lucky if you get to work with a director three, four, five times. These guys have come in not knowing each other at all, and they have formed a very tight bond, a family. And that's also helped them to get up on stage because they got each other's backs in a way that is unusual these days, when really your, 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 your attention is focused between your thumbs. Right? So when you watch them work, understand the process that they went through, which is to get rid of their self-consciousness, doing exercises, doing beginning acting exercises, moving on to doing small scenes, and in the process learning how to memorize lines. It's the grunt work of the industry. You get lines you have to somehow stick in your head so that they stay there. For a lot of people, that's an extraordinary challenge. And the one question that actors get asked probably more than anything else, how did you memorize all those lines? Well, they had to learn how to do that. They've never memorized so many lines in their life. And not just that, they didn't memorize just any old line. They memorized Shakespeare. And they memorized Shakespeare so well that when you hear them work this afternoon, it'll sound like it's their native tongue. And having memorized the lines, they then had to memorize the blocking. And for those of you that don't know, blocking is where actors move. So when I directed the scenes, I had to tell them, by and large, where to move, when to move, what they should be doing at any one time, how to move on the stage, where there is power on the stage, 
where they are uncomfortably close to the audience. All of those things they had to learn and memorize as well as their lines. And when they got to the point where they had their lines memorized and their blocking memorized, they could, they could pick their faces up off the page and look into each other's eyes with no self-consciousness and begin to relate to each other as, as characters in a play. I guarantee you, you will never see it done as well as these guys do this afternoon. That's what they've learned. They have learned the process, the craft of acting. And in the end, they've done the one thing that's the most important element of all, is that they're able to get up here, and my favorite expression in the whole business, give it to the house. Because without you, the process doesn't work. So when they speak, you will hear them speak with clarity. When they speak, you will hear them because they will project. Because they are doing it for you. And I tell them, even if you're having a conversation between two people down here, you're actually talking to them. So how they open their mouths, how they pronounce their words, all of that is for you. And for that reason, I really appreciate you all coming this afternoon. I'm going to hand it over to Stephanie, and I hope you enjoy the show. Thanks. So, as you said, thank you guys for coming. So we're going to jump into our warm-ups, but before we do, I just want to tell you guys why we do our warm-ups. So our warm-ups are um, done because, like other professions, they bring briefcases, they bring whatever equipment they need. But for actors, as we are, we only have us. We have our bodies. That's, that is the only equipment we bring with us, and you know, we keep it light because you know, it's just us. So we, gotta, we have to warm up, we have to get ready, we have to put these characters on and be relaxed and be ready to be these people, um, you know, and be kind of separate from ourselves, but at the same time have it be a part of ourselves. So we are going to warm up now. And, uh, shake it out. Legs in there. Check out the legs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One arm over. Switch outside. Do some shoulder circles. Switch, go the other way. Check it out. Okay, reach up and reach down. Take a deep breath in and out. Make sure you relax, your body is just dangling freely. Okay, slowly bring it up. And once you come up, go back. Stretch out your back. Some washing machines. <laughs> okay, neck circles. Switch, go the other way. Okay, let your head fall to the back. Hand on your stomach. <clears throat> Five, pause, ready, go. Ha! 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 Shake it out. <clears throat> Find a partner, <coughs> do a couple trust falls.
reason we do, well, the trust fall, sometimes people do it as a joke, but we do, we take that seriously because we really need to trust each other in these scenes that we're doing, because as you'll see, some of them get really intense, and we need to be able to trust wherever our partner goes in that scene, that we can follow them and we can trust where they're going, isn't going to mess mess up our character, mess up what we're doing, but we can work as a team to get this scene done and, you know, to entertain you guys, That's and that's why we're here. So the trust fall, on one side, yes, it's kind of funny, it's kind of like a joke, but on the other side, it's very important because it shows how much we can appreciate and trust each other when we do these scenes. And then, you know, the other exercises that get us warmed up and they get us relaxed and they, you know, get us ready to do what we do in this environment. So we are going to jump into our first scene and I will let them introduce their scene. First scene we are performing today is a scene from uh, The Crucible. I'm playing John Hale. My name is Steven Diaz. I'm playing Tituba. I'm Kaisha uh, I'm playing Abigail. My name is Wendy Ortega. And I'm playing Paris. My name is Corey Cardoza. I'm Claudia. I'm playing Betty. Now mark me, if the devil is in her, you will witness some frightful wonders in this room. So please to keep your wits about you. Mr. Putnam, stand close in case she flies. Now, Betty dear, will you sit up? Can you hear me? I am John Hale, minister of Beverly. I have come to help you, my dear. Do you remember my two little girls in Beverly? Does someone afflict you, child? It need not be a woman, mind you, or a man. Perhaps some bird invisible to others comes to you. Perhaps a pig or any beast at all. Is there some figure that bids you fly? Inomenai, domino sabbat, cephalic. Ite de infiernos! Abigail, what sort of dancing were you doing with her in the forest? Why, common dancing is all. I think I ought to say that I, I saw a kettle on the grass where they were dancing. Why, that were only soup. Soup? What sort of soup were in this kettle, Abigail? Why, beans and lentils, I think, and... Mr. Putnam, you did not notice, did you, any living thing in this kettle? A mouse, perhaps a spider, a frog... That frog jumped in. We never put it in. Abigail, it may be your cousin is dying. Did you call the devil last night? I never called the devil. Tituba called him. She called devil. I should like to speak with Tituba. How did she call him? I know not. She spoke Barbados. Did you feel any strangeness when she called him? A sudden cold wind, perhaps? A tremble below the ground? I never saw no devil. Betty, wake up! Betty! Betty! You cannot Betty, wake evade up. me, Betty, Abigail. Betty, did Betty, your cousin drink any of the brew in the She never drank it. Did you drink it? No, sir. Did Tituba ask you to drink it? She tried, but I refused. Why are you concealing? Have you sold yourself to Lucifer? I never sold myself. I'm a good girl. I, I, I did drink out of the kettle. She made me do it. She made Betty do it, too. Abby! She makes me drink blood. Blood? No, no chicken's blood. I give she chicken's blood. Woman. Have you enlisted these children for the devil? No, sir. I don't truck with the devil. Why can she not wait? Are you silencing this child? I love me, Betty. You have sent your spirit out upon this child, have you not? Are you gathering souls for the devil? She sent her spirit at me at church. She made me laugh at prayer. She has often laughed at prayer. She comes to me in my dreams to go and drink blood. You begged me to conjure, Abby. She begged me to make charm. I'll tell you something. She comes to me in my sleep, and she's always making me dream corruption. Abby! I hear her laughing in my sleep and tempting me with her Barbados songs. Mr. Reverend, I never... When did you compact with the devil? I don't compact with no devil. You will confess yourself, or I'll take you out and whip to your death, Tichiba. This woman should be hanged. She should be taken and hanged. No, no, don't hang Tichiba. I tell him, I don't desire to work for him, sir. Who, the devil? Now, Tituba, I know that when we bind ourselves to hell, it is very hard to break with it entirely. Now, we are going to help you tear yourself free. You would be a good Christian woman, would you not, Tituba? Yes, sir, uh, a good Christian woman. And you love this child? Yes, sir. I don't desire to hurt little children. And you love God, Tituba? I love God with all my being. Now, in God's holy name. Bless him, bless him. <laughs> 
and to his glory. Eternal glory, bless him, bless God. Open yourself, Tituba, open yourself and let God's holy light shine on oh, you. bless the Lord. When the devil comes to you, does he ever come with another person? Perhaps another person in the village, someone you know. Who came to you with the devil? Two, three, four, how many? There were four, there were four. Who, who, their names, their names. Oh, how many times he bid me kill you, Mr. Paris? Kill me? He said, Mr. Paris must be killed. Mr. Paris no goodly man, Mr. Paris mean man, and no gentleman, and he bid me to rise out of my bed and cut your throat. But I tell him, no, I don't hate that man. I don't want to kill that man. But he said, you work for me, Tichaba, and I make you free. I give you pretty dress to wear and put you way high up in the air, and you're going to fly back to my bed. And I say, no, devil, you lie, devil, you lie. And then he come to me one stormy night. He say, look, I got white people that work for me. And I look, and there was Goody Good. Sarah Good? I sir, and Goody Osborne. Take courage. You must give us all their names. How can you bear to see this child suffering? Look at her, Tintu, but look at her God-given innocence. Her spirit is so tender. We must protect her, Tintu, but the devil is out preying upon her like the beast upon the flesh of the pure lamb. God will bless you for your help. I want to open myself. I want the light of God, the sweet love of Jesus. I danced for the devil. I saw him. I wrote in his book. I go back to Jesus. I kiss his hand. I saw Sarah Good with the devil. I saw Goody Osborne with the devil. I saw Bridget Bishop with the devil. I saw her Jacobs with the devil. She speaks. She speaks. Glory to God. It is broken. She is free. I saw Goody Zimmer with the devil. See. I'm Williams, and we are. I will be performing a scene from The Merchant of Venice, and I'm Shylock. I'm John, and I'll be playing a person he's talking to. <laughs> Senor Antonio, many a time and often the Rialto, you have rated me in my monies and my usances. Still, have I borne it with a patient shrug, for sufferance is the badge of all our tribe. You call me a misbeliever, cutthroat dog, you spit on my Jewish gabardine, and all for what use and which is my own. Well then, it appears you need my help. Go to, then you come to me and you say, Shylock, we would have monies. You say so you. You, that did void your room upon my beard and foot me as you spurn a stranger cur over your threshold. Monies is your suit. What shall I say to you? Should I not say how, how the dog money? Is it possible a cur can land 3,000 ducats? Or should I bend low in a bondman's key with bated breath, whispering with humbleness, say this, fair sir, you spit on me one day, alas, you spurred me such a day. Another time you call me a dog, and for these courtesies, I shall lend you thus much money? See. Lawrence and Romeo and Juliet. My name's Kyle Ferris, and I'll be playing Romeo. God, pardon sin, was that with Rosaline? With Rosaline, my ghostly father? No, I've forgotten that name, and that name is Woke. That's my good son. But where has thou been then? I'll tell thee. Has thou asking me again? I have been feasting my enemy. Be plain, my good son, and homely in thy drift. Riddling confession finds but riddling shrift. Then plainly know that my heart's dearest love is set on the fair rich daughter of Capulet. As mine is on hers, so hers is set on mine. And I'll combine, <coughs> say what thou must combine, by holy marriage, when, where, and how we met. We wooed and exchanged a vow. I'll tell thee as we pass, but this I pray. That thou consent to marry us today. Holy Saint Francis, what a change is here. Is Rosaline, who thou didst love so dear, so soon forsaken? Young men's love lies not truly in their hearts, but in their eyes. Jesu Maria, what a deal of brine hath washed over thy sallow cheeks for Rosaline. Lo, upon thy cheek the stain doth sit of an old tear not washed off yet. And art thou changed? Pronounce this sentence then. 
Women may fall when there is no strength in men. Thou chidst me off for loving Rosaline. For doting, not for loving pupil mine. Oh, bathed me buried love. One to lay in a grave, another out to have. I pray thee, chide not. She whom I love now doth grace for grace and love for love allow. The other did not so. In this one respect though thy assistant be. For this alliance may so prove to turn your household's rancor to pure love. Oh, let us hence. Wisely and slow, they stumble that run fast. See. You'll be doing the scene from Caesar. I'll be playing Caesar. I'm Jessica. I'll be playing Calpurnia. And my name is Ivan Carrion, and I will be Decius Brutus. <coughs> What mean you, Caesar? Think you to walk forth? You shall not stir out of your house today. Caesar shall forth the things that threaten me. Then look but on my back, and they shall see the face of Caesar. They are vanished. Caesar, I never stood on ceremonies. Yet now they fright me. There is one within, besides the things we have heard and seen, recounts the most horrid sights seen by the watch. A lioness hath whelped in the streets. And graves have yawned and yielded up their dead. Fierce, fiery warriors fought upon the clouds in ranks and squadrons and right forms of war with strips of blood upon the capital. The noise of battle hurtled in the air. Horses did neigh and dying men did groan and ghosts did shriek and school about the streets. Caesar, these things are beyond all use and I do fear them. What can be avoided? Who's in this purpose by the mighty gods? Yet Caesar shall go forth, for these predictions are to the world in general as to Caesar. When beggars die, there are no comets seen. The heavens themselves blaze forth the death of princes. Cowards die many times before their death. The valley of taste of death but once, of all the wonders I yet have heard. It seems to me most strange that men should fear, seeing that death is a necessary end, and it will come when it will come. What say the augurers? They would not have you steer forth today. Plucking the entrails of an offering forth, they cannot find a heart within the beast. The gods do this in shame of cowardice. Caesar should be a beast without a heart. If I were to stay at home today for fear, no, Caesar shall not. For danger knows full well that Caesar is more dangerous than he. We are two lions nearer than one day, and I, the elder, more terrible. Caesar shall go forth. Alas, my lord, your wisdom is consumed in confidence. Do not go forth today. Call it my fear that keeps you in the house and not your own. We'll send Mark Anthony to the Senate house, and he shall say you are not well today. Let me, upon my knees, prevail in this. Mark Anthony shall say, I am not well, and for thy humor, I will stay at home. Here's Decius Brutus, he shall tell them so. Caesar, all hail. Good morrow to you, worthy Caesar. I come to fetch you to the Senate house. And you have come in very happy time to bear my greetings to the senators and tell them I will not come. Can I this false and dare I this falser? Go tell them, Decius, I will not come today. Say he is sick. Should Caesar send a lie? Have I not in kind which stretches my arm to be afraid to tell great beers the truth? Caesar, uh, go tell them Caesar will not come. Most mighty Caesar, let me know some cause, lest I be laughed at when I tell them so. The cause is in my will. I will not come. That is enough to satisfy the Senate. But because I love you, for, and for your private satisfaction, I will let you know. Capunia here, my wife, stayed me at home. She dreameth last night that she saw my statue like a fountain with a hundred spots, dear world, pure blood. And many lusty Romans came smiling and bathed their hands in it. This dream is all a misinterpreted. It was a vision fair and fortunate. Your statue spouting blood from many pipes in which so many smiling Romans bathed. 
signifies that from you great Rome shall suck reviving blood, and that great men shall press for tinctures, stains, relics, and cognizance. This by Calpurnian's dream is signified. At least you have well expounded. I have, and when you have heard what I can say, and know it now, the Senate have concluded to give this day a crown to mighty Caesar. If you shall send them word that you will not come, their minds may change. Besides, it were a mock apt to be rendered for someone to say, break up the Senate till another time, when Caesar's wife shall meet with better dreams? If Caesar hide himself, shall they not whisper low? Is Caesar afraid? Pardon me, Caesar, for my dear, dear love to our proceedings bid me to tell you this. And reason to my love is liable. How foolish are your fears now, Capernia? I am ashamed I did yield to them. Give me my robe, for I will go. See. Thou, nature, art my goddess. To thy law my services are bound. Wherefore should I stand in the plague of custom and permit the curiosity of nations to deprive me for that I am some twelve or fourteen moonshine's lag of a brother? Why, bastard? Wherefore, base? When my dimensions are as well compact, my mind is generous, my shape is true, as honest as Madam's issue. Why brand they us with base, with baseness, bastardy, pace, base, who in lusty stealth of nature take more composition and fierce quality than doff within a dull, stale, tired bed, go to the creating a whole tribe of fops, God's tween asleep and wake. Well then, my legitimate Edgar, I must have your land. Our father's love is to the bastard Edmund as to the legitimate. Fine word. Legitimate. Well, my legitimate, if this letter speed and my invention thrive, Edmund the base shall top the legitimate. I grow. I prosper. Now, God, stand up for bastards. See. John Proctor? And I'm Laura, and I'm playing Elizabeth. <laughs> what keeps you so late? It's almost dark. I were planting far out to the forest, Dutch. Oh, you're done then? Aye, the, the farm is seated. Uh, are the boys asleep? They will be soon. Pray now for a fair summer. Aye. Are you well today? I am. You come so late, I thought you'd gone to Salem this afternoon. Why? I have no business in Salem. You did speak of going earlier this week. I thought better of it since. Mary Warren's there today. Why'd you let her? You heard me forbid her go to Salem anymore. I forbid her go. And she raises up her chin like the daughter of a prince and says to me, I must go to Salem, Goody Proctor. I'm an official of the court. Court? What court? Aye, it is a proper court they have now. They've sent four judges out of Boston, she says, waiting magistrates of the general court, and at the head sits the deputy governor of the province. Why, she's mad. I would to God she were. There'll be 14 people in the jail now, she says, and they'll be tried, and the court have power to hang them too. Uh, they never hang the them. The deputy governor promised hanging if they'll not confess, John. The town has gone wild, I think. 
Mary Warren speak of Abigail as though she were a saint to hear her. She brings the other girls into the court, and where she walks, the crowd will part like the sea for Israel. And folks are brought before them, and if Abigail scream and howl and fall to the floor, the persons clapped in the jail for bewitching her. Oh, it is a black mischief. I think you must go to Salem, John. I think so. You must tell them. It is a fraud. Aye, it is. It is, surely. Let you go to Ezekiel Cheever. He knows you well. And tell him what she said to you last week in her uncle's house. She said it had not to do with witchcraft, did she not? Aye, she did. She did. God forbid you keep this from the court, John. I think they must be told. Aye, they, they must. They must. You know, it's wonder they do believe her. I would go to Salem now, John. Let you go tonight. I'll think on it. You cannot keep it, John. I know I cannot keep it. I said I will think on it. Good then. Let you think on it. I'm only wondering how I may prove what she told me, Elizabeth. If the girl's a saint now, I think it not easy to prove her fraud. And the town's gone so silly. She told it to me in a room alone. I have no proof for it. You were alone with her? For a moment, yes. Why, then it is not as you told me. For a moment, the others come in soon after. Do as you wish, then. Woman, I will not have your suspicion anymore. I have no. I'll not have it. Then let you not hurt And you done me yet. John, if it were not Abigail, who you must go to hurt, would you falter now? I think not. Now look you. I see what I see, John. Woman, I will not have your suspicion anymore. I have good reason to think before I charge fraud on Abigail. And I said I will think on it. May you look to your own improvement before you go to judge your husband anymore. I do not judge you. The magistrate sits in your heart that judges you. I never thought you but a good man, John. Only somewhat bewildered. Oh, Elizabeth, your justice would freeze beer. I'll be playing Ophelia. Good, my lord. How is your honor for this many a day? I humbly thank you. Well. 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 Uh, my honored lord, I have remembrances of yours that I've longed, longed to re-deliver. I pray you now receive them? No, not I. I never gave you what? My honored lord, you know right well that you did. And with them, words so sweet composed made the gifts more rich. Their perfume is lost now. Take these again, for to the noble mind, rich gifts wax poor when givers prove unkind. There, my lord. Are you honest? My lord. Are you fair? What means your lordship? That if you be honest and fair, your honesty should admit no discourse to your beauty. Could beauty, my lord, have any better comments than with honesty? Aye, truly. For the power of beauty will sooner transform honesty from what it is to a bond, than the force of honesty can translate beauty into his likeness. This was sometime a paradox, but now the time gives it proof. I did love you once. Indeed, you made me believe so. You should not have believed me. For virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock, but we shall relish of it. I loved you not. I was the more deceived. Get thee to a nunnery. Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? I am myself indifferent, honest, yet I could accuse me of such things that it were better had my mother not borne me. I am very proud. Revengeful, ambitious, with more offenses at my beck than I have thoughts to put them in, imagination to give them shape, or time to add them in. What are fellows such as I to do wandering between earth and heaven? We are errant knaves, all. Believe none of us. What would I waste to an honor? Where's your father? At home, my lord. Let the doors be shut upon him, that he may play the fool no more by that stone house! Farewell! Sweet heavens, help him! If thou dost marry, I'll give thee this plague as thy dowry. 
Be thou as chaste as ice, as pure as snow. Thou wilt not escape calling me. Farewell. Oh! If thou wilt needs marry, marry a fool. For wise men know well enough what monsters you make of them. To an unearth. Go, and quickly too. Farewell. Sweet heavens, help him. I've heard two of your paintings well enough. God has given you one face, and you make yourself another. You jig, you amble, and you lisp, and you nickname God's creatures and make your wantonness your ignorance. Go to, I'll have no more on it. And that made me mad! I say we will have no more marriages. All that are married, all but one shall live. The rest shall keep as they are. To a nunnery. Go! See you. I am going to be playing a monologue from Merchant of Venice. I'm John. And I'm Shire. Shylock, sorry. <laughs> Shylock. And this is Antonio. <laughs> Senor Antonio, many a time and often the Rialto you have rated me of my money and usances. Still have I borne it with a patient shrug, for sufferance is the badge of all our tribe. You call me misbeliever, cutthroat dog. You spit upon my Jewish gabardine and offer use of that which is mine own? Well, it will now appear that you need my help. Go to, you say, you come to me and you say, Shylock, we will have money, you say. You, that did void your room upon my beard, and foot me as you would spurn a stranger cur over your threshold. Money is your suit? What, what shall I say? Shall I not say, have the dog money? Is it possible a cur can lend 3,000 ducats? Or shall I bend low in a bondsman's key with bated breath and whispering humbleness say this, Yes, sir, you spit on me on Wednesday last. You spurned me on such a day. Another time you called me dog. And for these courtesies, I'll lend you thus much money. We're going to be doing a scene from Julius Caesar. I'm going to be playing Caesar. I'm Jessica, I'll be playing Calpurnia. And I'm Ivan, I'll be Decius Brutus again. <laughs> <laughs> Double duty. What mean you, Caesar? Think you to walk forth? You shall not stay out of your house today. Caesar, shout forth! The things that threaten me ne'er look but on my back. When they shall see the face of Caesar, they are banished. Caesar, I never stood on ceremonies. Yet now they fright me. There is one within, besides the things we have heard and seen, recounts most horrid sights seen by the watch. A lioness hath whelped in the streets, and graves have yawned and yielded up their dead. Fierce, fiery warriors fought upon the clouds in ranks and squadrons and right forms of war with strips of blood upon the capital. The noise of battle hurtled in the air. Horses did neigh and dying men did groan and ghosts did shriek and squeal about the streets. Caesar, these things are beyond all use and I do fear them. What can be avoided? Whose end is purpose by the mighty gods? Yet Caesar shall go forth, for these predictions are to the world in general, as to Caesar. When beggars die, there are no comets seen. The heavens themselves brings forth the death of princes. Cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant never taste death but once. Of all the wonders I have yet heard, it seems to me most strange that men should fear, seeing that death, a necessary end, will come when it will come. What say the augurs? They would not have you stir forth today. Pluck in, the, pluck in the entrails of an offering forth. They cannot find a heart within the beast. The gods do this in shame of cowardice. Caesar should be a beast without a heart. If he should stay at home today to fear, no, Caesar shall not. For danger knows full well that Caesar is more dangerous than he. 
We are two lions layered in one day, and I the elder, and more terrible, and Caesar shall go forth. Alas, my lord, your wisdom is consumed in confidence. Do not go forth today. Call it my fear that keeps you in the house, and not your own. We'll send Mark Anthony to the Senate house, and he shall say you are not well today. Caesar, let me, upon my knees, prevail in this. Mark Anthony shall say, I am not well, and for that humor, I will stay at home today. His disease Brutus, he shall tell them so. Caesar, all hail. Good morrow to you, worthy Caesar. I come to fetch you to the Senate house. And you come in very happy time to bear my greetings to the senators, and to tell them that I will not come. Cannot is false, and that I dare not, falser. I will not come today. Tell them so, Decius. Say he is sick. Shall Caesar send a lie? Have I and Caucus Church, my and arm, so far to be afraid to tell Greybeards the truth? Decius, tell them Caesar will not come. Most mighty Caesar, let me know some cause, lest I be laughed at when I tell them so. The cause is in my will. That is enough to satisfy the Senate. But for your own private satisfaction, because I love you, I will let you know. Calpurnia here, my wife, stays me at home today. She had dreamt that she saw my statue, which like a fountain with a hundred spouts did run pure blood, and many lusty Romans came smiling and did bathe their hands in it. And this she applies for warnings and portents and evils imminent, and on her knees has begged me to stay at home today. This dream is all a misinterpreted. It was a vision fair and fortunate. Your statue spouting blood from many pipes, in which so many smiling Romans bathed, signifies that from you great Rome shall suck reviving blood, and that great men shall press for tinctures, stains, relics, and cognizance. This by Calpurnia's dream is signified. And this way you have well expounded it. I have, and when you have heard what I can say, and know it now, the Senate have concluded to give this day a crown to mighty Caesar. If you shall send them word that you will not come, their minds may change. Besides, it were a mock apt to be rendered for someone to say, break up the Senate till another time, when Caesar's wife shall meet with better dreams. If Caesar hide himself, shall they not whisper low, is Caesar afraid? Pardon me, Caesar. For my dear, dear love to our proceedings, bid me tell you this, and reason to my love is liable. How foolish do your fears seem now, Calpurnia? I am ashamed I did yield to them. Bring me my robe, for I will go. Sing. With Portia and Brutus, I am playing Brutus and Portia. I'm Joanna Medina. Before we start, uh, Burgos's point goal here is to show that a female could play a male part and vice versa. Across. And when I asked you what the matter was, you stared upon me with ungentle looks. I urged you further, and you'd scratch your head and twig patiently, stamp with your foot. Yet I insisted, yet you'd answer not. But with an angry rapture of your hand, gave sign for me to leave you. So I did, fearing to strengthen that impatience which seemed too much enkindled, and with all hoping it was but an effect of humor, which hath some time his hour with every man. It would not let you eat, nor talk, nor sleep, 
and could it work so much upon your shape as it must much prevailed upon your condition? I, I should not know you, Brutus. Dear my lord, make me acquainted with your cause of grief. I am not well in health, and that is all. Brutus is wise, and were he not in health, he would embrace the means to come by it. Why, so I do. Good Portia, go to bed. Is Brutus sick? And is it physical to walk unbraced and suck up the humors of a cold, dank morning? What? Is Brutus sick that he should steal out of his wholesome bed to die of the vile contagion of the night and to tempt the roomy and unpurged air to add unto his sickness? No, oh, my Brutus, there is some sick offense within your mind. And by the right and virtue of my place, I ought to know. When upon my knees I charm you, by my once committed beauty, and by all your vows of love, and that great vow which did incorporate us and make us one, that you should have fallen to me. You, yourself, you're half why you're so happy. And what men tonight have had to resort to you? For there have been some six. For seven men who did hide their faces even from darkness. Kneel not, gentle Portia. I should not need to if you were gentle, Brutus. Within the bond of marriage, tell me, Brutus, is it expected that I should know no secrets that appertain to you? Am I, but as it were, in sort or limitation, to keep with you at meals, to comfort your bed, and to talk to you sometimes? Well, I but in the suburbs of your good pleasure. If it be no more, Portia is Brutus's harlot, not his wife. You are my true and honorable wife, as dear to me as the ready drops that visit my sad heart. If this were true, then I should know this secret. I grant that I'm a woman, but with all a woman that Lord Brutus took to wife. I grant that I'm a woman. But a woman of well reputed, Cato's daughter. Think you I'm no stronger than my sex, being so fathered and so husband? Tell me your consuls. I will not disclose them. I have given strong proof of my constancy, giving myself a voluntary wound here in the thigh. Can I bear that with patience? And not my husband's secrets? O oh, ye gods, render me worthy of this noble wife. Insanity. You love this child? I, sir, have no desire to hurt little children. And you love God, did you? I love God with all my being. Now, in God's holy name. Bless him, bless him. And to his glory. The eternal glory, bless him, bless open God. Open yourself. Tichba, open yourself and let God's holy light shine on you. Oh, bless the Lord! When the devil comes to you, does he ever come with another person? Perhaps someone from the village, someone you know. Who came to you with the devil? Two, three, four, how many? There was four! There was four! Who? Who? Their names! Their names! Oh, how many times he bid me kill you, Mr. Paris. Kill me? He said Mr. Paris must be killed. Mr. Paris, no goodly man. Mr. Paris, mean man and no gentleman. And he bid me rise out of my bed and cut your throat. But I tell him, no, I don't hate that man. I don't want to kill that man. But he said you work for me, Tichuba, and I make you free. I give you pretty dress to wear, put you way high up in the air, and you will fly back to Barbados. But I tell him, no, devil, no. And then he comes to me one stormy night. And you say, look, I have white people belong to me. And I look, and there was Goody Good. Sarah Good? I, sir, Goody Osborne. Take courage. You must give us all their names. How can you bear to see this child suffering? Tichiba, look at her. Look at her God-given innocence. Her soul is so tender. We must protect her. Tichiba, the devil is out and preying on her like the beast upon the flesh of the pure lamb. God will bless you for your help. I want to help it myself. I want the light of God. I want the sweet love of Jesus. I danced for the devil. I saw him. I wrote in his book. I go back to Jesus. I kiss his hand. I saw 
Sarah Good with the devil. I saw Good Osborne with the devil. I saw Bridget Bishop with the devil. I saw Jack Jacobs with the devil. She speaks. She speaks. Glory to God. It is broken. She is free. I saw Goody Sivir with the devil. See.